The Bob Murphy Show, episode 136. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. In this one, I am going to be giving a framework for thinking about things like inflation, money, credit, debt, so forth. It's a response or a follow-up to episode 130, the marathon session. It was almost three hours long that I had with Rowan Gray on MMT. But this is more of a standalone thing. So even if you didn't listen to much of the Rowan episode, you'll still be able to benefit from this episode that I'm doing right now. And also, I just want to clarify, it's not so much that I'm going to say, ah, Rowan said this at the 47-minute mark, and my response is da 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 it's not a, a point by point response. This is more, I want to give my framework for how I think about these things. And then that will probably shed light on a lot of the trains of thought that I was developing in my conversation with Rowan. Unfortunately, with some of them, I didn't get the chance to really flush it out. Like it was sort of like we got sidetracked on a different tangent. And so I thought it would be helpful if I just gave you in one spot the framework that I use for these types of considerations. Just for its own sake, but also then, like I say, it'll probably, for those of you who did go beyond the call of duty and listen to that whole episode with Rowan, this should shed a lot of light on that. Let me also mention what I'm going to be giving you here. Obviously, there's going to be some Austrian flavor to it, but this, strictly speaking, is not the Austrian framework for thinking about money and inflation and debt. This is actually going to be a pretty standard approach, right? So lots of economists, not just those narrowly in the Austrian school would use the general framework that I'm going to be talking about in this episode. So keep that in mind. So before I jump into the analysis, let me give the disclaimer. One could certainly zing me right out of the chute by saying, oh, Murphy's talking about inflation and how he thinks about it. That didn't serve him too well back when he lost his bets, did it? And so for those of you who don't know, the worst mistake of my professional career was that I made a bet with uh, first Brian Kaplan and then David R. Henderson back when the rounds of QE were starting up that I said that there would be a 12-month period where official CPI would rise by more than 10%. That obviously didn't happen, and so I had to pay them. I lost the bets, and Brad DeLong and Paul Krugman noted the fact. I actually think Brad DeLong literally put it on his computer calendar because he pounced right when, it, right when I was losing. And uh, anyway, so that was a very good feather in their cap. So I will give my explanation. I'll link at bobmurphyshow.com slash 136. I will link to things if you care about that and want to see what the, what the issue was and then what my response is after the carnage ensued. So I will put that in the show notes page. So I just want to put that on the table to get it out of the way. But as we'll see here, what I'm giving is is a framework for just this is how economists interpret this stuff. Okay, so again, if you want to say, it, but when all is said and done, ah, that this this is a bad framework, so be it. But I at least want to explain what the framework is. Okay, so oh, one one other clarification. I'm looking at my notes here. The word inflation historically meant expansion of the quantity of money or money and credit broadly defined. And then, and of course, that would typically go hand in hand with rising prices, right? If you expanded the quantity of money, other things equal, that would tend to raise prices quoted in, in that money. But then for whatever reason, some people are cynical about it and think it was on purpose to obscure the culprit. Over time, over the 20th century, the word inflation came to be associated not with expanding the quantity of money and or credit, but with rising prices, and in particular consumer prices. And, the, and so then, you know, that's why people worry about, oh, is there too much inflation? They're not talking about 
the monetary base or how much did M1 go up? They mean when I go to the grocery store, is milk a lot more expensive than it used to be? So notice even there too, like I say, it's typically when people worry about inflation nowadays, it's not merely that they worry about prices, it's that they worry about consumer prices, right? So if your 401k went up 20% in a year, people aren't fretting about, oh man, there was a lot of inflation last year. Because notice that means certain prices, the you know, prices of stocks and or bonds went up. That's not what people are worried about. And you also typically don't hear people say, oh man, I bought my house for $100,000 three years ago. And now if I wanted to, I could sell it for 200000 This inflation is getting out of hand. You know what I'm saying? That's not what people also mean when they talk about inflation, even though, again, that would be a certain price rising rapidly. All right. So again, what they typically mean nowadays is the prices of goods that consumers buy or things like education and, and, and health care, stuff like that. Okay. So to avoid confusion, because I don't like to endorse that terminological shift. I think that that was harmful and that it, it obscures the, the culprit in this, that it makes it harder to identify who's causing these problems when you just start talking about the symptoms rather than the cause. But on the other hand, I don't want to just use the term inflation in an idiosyncratic sense that only Austrians would understand and can, that would confuse people. So the way I handle this is I really try to always be clear to put an adjective in front of it. So I will say monetary inflation or price inflation rather than just the open-ended term inflation where you wouldn't know which one I meant. Okay. So I'll try to do, I always try to do that in any conversation, but in this one also, I'll try to be clear. And hopefully if I just say the word inflation, I would have previously in that paragraph, let's say, specify what kind of inflation I mean. So if I talk about inflationary pressures or things like that, you'll hopefully know the context because I would have already established it. Okay, so let's dive in. One way that economists deal with money and prices and things like that is using the so-called equation of exchange. So there's different versions of it, things like M times V equals P times T or MV equals PQ, or MV equals P lowercase y. You probably have seen one or more of those uh, variants of the equation of exchange. So once you understand how those terms are defined, it's actually not a theory. It's, a, it's an accounting identity or a tautology, right? It, it's necessarily true. It's not that, oh, Keynesians think it's true and monitors think it's true, but post Keynesians don't or other, no, it's, if you understand what the terms mean, then yes, it's, if you think those terms are coherent and meaningful, then okay, yeah, the equation has to be true. So M stands for the quantity of money. V stands for the velocity of circulation. You can think of it as how many times on average does a piece of money change hands? Let's, I'm just going to use dollars for the rest of this because otherwise it's going to get, it's going to be too abstract, right? So I'll use dollars. So M is how many dollars are there at any moment? V is or actually it would not have any moment. It's going to be over a period of time. So let's let's say we're talking about a year. So M would be, I guess, the average number of dollars in existence over the course of the year because it could change over time. V is, on average, a typical dollar bill. How often does it change hands in the course of a year? And then like a $10 bill would be 10 times that and so forth. So M times V, that side of the equation, what does that mean? It's how much total spending was there, right? Because it's the total number of dollars times the average number of times that a dollar bill changes hands. So that's measuring the total number of dollars changing hands in a transaction. So you can think of it as total spending. And then what's the other side of the equation? P times Q, let's use that version. P is the price level, the average price level quoted in dollars. And Q is total output. Okay, and measured in real goods. And so the average price level of a good quoted in dollars or service times the total amount, the quantity of output is also going to be equal to the total number of dollars that change hands. Right. And so once you know what those terms mean, you can see necessarily those two sides of the equator. Yeah, each side of the equation must equal the other. So this isn't, again, based on an economic theory, it's a tautology, it's an identity. Okay, just be careful. The easiest way, the, the cleanest way to think about it is all transactions would have to be included, 
right? If, if, if M and V are what I just said they were, then everything has to be included, in which case, strictly speaking, Q can't mean total output. It has to be everything that's sold, including like financial assets. So you, you sell shares of stock for $100 each. That turnover of the money would also have to go in, into V, and therefore the Q would have to include that. And, so, and actually, in previous formulations, they, that's what they would do, P times T. T would be like total transactions. However, for various reasons, economists don't like to include that stuff. They want to focus on real output, by which they mean like newly produced goods and services, like what's part of real GDP or what is real GDP. So to make that happen, if, if Q just includes real output and doesn't include stuff like sales of financial assets or sales of previously built houses and stuff like that, or used cars, if that's what Q refers to as just newly produced goods and services, then the V has to exclude any dollars changing hands for those transactions. Okay, so you can see how contrived this gets after a while. You know, it would, it would and, and this is part of the reason Austrians in particular, certainly Rothbardians, don't like using the equation of exchange to handle things like inflation and, you know, purchasing power of money and stuff like that. So one problem is, notice it's it's a very holistic and mechanistic framework, right? There's there's no individual preferences involved there. It's, it's sort of like looking at the economy from a bird's eye view as an engineer, the way you would look at like water flow through a, through a pipe system or something. So again, it's not that it's wrong. It's just, it's arguably not economics. It's, it's me mechanics or something, All right? So there's that element. But then also, uh, like I say, it's like v the terms V and P are not like, like to, to make the thing work and do what you want. You have to define them in a certain way that's very contrived and that no one in practice uses, right? So nobody, when he or she makes decisions in the marketplace, cares about V and nobody cares about the average price level. Because notice, too, that it's a weighted thing. Like a, the, the fact that a pack of gum costs a quarter and a car costs $30,000, those don't equally go into the average price level. The car is much more heavily weighted in there, um, at least per car. Like it depends how many packs of gum get sold, I guess, compared to how many cars, right? So what this is a point that Rothbard made is that s certain of these variables, it's almost like they only make sense in reference to the equation, right? So really what we mean by V is just rearranging the other terms in the equation to, to get it. And so it's, it's, it's not very useful to think of, oh yes, there's these four independent things that have their own existence and then they come together in this equation that really sheds light on the relationships. It's more like at least one of the variables or two of them are kind of like they only make sense in the context of that equation in the first place. Okay, so there's that element you know, and by the way, I'll, I'll see if I can find a good link to that. So again, this is bobmurphyshow.com slash 136. In the show notes page, I'll see if I can link to where Rothbard gives his critique of the equation of exchange. Again, just to be clear, it's not that we're saying it's wrong. It's just, it's not really economics. Or it's certainly not in the spirit of economics that developed after the subjective marginal revolution. Okay, so what is a, what would a more economics see? approach to money and price inflation and things like that look like it's a cash balance approach. So here, rather than following dollars around as they change hands, instead, the locus of analysis is the individual who, and it's focusing on the supply of and demand for money. And the issue is, okay, and, and how to like, forget money for some, for apples, what do we do in economics like to talk about, oh, what's the market for apples? Well, you have the supply curve of apples, the demand curve for apples. You figure out where they cross. That's the market clearing price of apples in equilibrium, right? You do the same thing with money. Let's say at any moment in equilibrium, every dollar has to be owned by someone. And that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Don't think of money, quote, in circulation, right? That... At any moment, right, when, you know, when there's a transaction, money changes hands. It goes from one owner over to the ownership of somebody else. There's no such thing as money that's just flowing around the economy that's not in somebody's cash balance. And, the, the, you know, that, and that's partly why I don't like the equation of exchange because, again, there, that makes you think of money as like 
in a river or something flowing around and that nobody owns it. And that's, that's not really helpful, I don't think. I think it's much more helpful to think of why do people want to hold money, right? So that, that's maybe one way of illustrating the divide. I think the average person typically views it as why do people want to spend money and how much money do they have to spend? And they think that's what influences all these other factors. But you could just do the flip side and think, why do people want to hold money? Because that's also a necessary condition. If somebody's spending money, that means somebody else must be receiving it. All right. So at any moment, we can define equilibrium as saying, what do all the prices look like such that given people's subjective preferences and their demand for holding cash balances, that we have equilibrium, that all the cash that does exist is in fact held by various people in the community and everybody's happy with his or her cash balances at that moment, given the market prices, the, like the constellation of market prices, all right? That would be equilibrium. No one would have any incentive to say, oh, wait a minute, I want to get rid of some of this cash or wait a minute, I don't have enough cash. I need to go get some more. Okay, now, admittedly, this is a very tricky thing because as time passes, people know they have to spend cash. Okay, so, you know, for example, oh, I know I'm going to go to this uh, marketplace, you know, this outdoor fair and buy a bunch of wares and people just take cash down there because it's easier. So I'm going to hit the ATM and load up and get $300, put it in my wallet and then go down there and spend it. You know, at at what point do we talk about equilibrium, right? It's because what happens is there's an initial equilibrium when I put the 300 in my wallet. And I could say, oh, I'm happy now that I have whatever, $364 in cash in my wallet. But then once I start walking down the table set up for this outdoor fair, I keep spending the money. And so you could say, ah, now the equilibrium has changed. Now instead of having 364, I want to have 344 if I just bought something that's $20. All right. So I get that the time element here is tricky. But nonetheless, I think this is the, the where you want to start with. To, to make sense of this thing, to apply a standard supply and demand framework to money. As you just, you know, again, start listing what are the what are the things influencing why someone would want to hold more or less cash. And then you use that framework. Okay. By the way, let me just back up a second. I forgot to give the punchline. So the MV equals PQ framework, what you could do with that, just to show to put it through its paces so you can see how you could deploy that is you could say something like, okay, suppose the quantity of money doubles, right? So M doubles. So that means, um, then you could say stuff like, if that doesn't change the velocity of circulation, then that means M times V doubles, right? So that whole side of the equation doubles. So that means the other side of the equation has to double because the equation has to be satisfied. So we know P times Q doubles. Now, how does that actually happen? Well, if Q remains the same, then P doubles, Right, So you could say stuff like, oh, in the long run, presumably changes in the quantity of money don't affect the velocity of circulation and they don't affect real output. So therefore, a change in the quantity of money in the long run leads to a proportional rise in prices or a fall if money gets cut in half or something. Right, So you could say things like that. So there, notice that relies on economic theory. Right, If you say changing the quantity of money doesn't affect velocity, it doesn't affect output, then you can conclude using the, the identity that, oh, so P must be the one that has all the action. But notice there, we've supplemented the equation with assumptions about what changing the money supply does. And that does rely on economic theory. Because if you're a Keynesian and you think you're in a liquidity trap, you could say, oh, in this stage, increasing the quantity of money, at least within a certain range, actually boosts real output. And so let's say you increase the quantity of money by 30%. If that means Q goes up 20%, real output goes up 20% because originally we were only at 80% capacity. Well, actually, um, you get, it's it's, it's not not quite that much, right? Because it's the percentage of the lower amount. But you get the idea of what I'm saying. Then prices don't need to rise as much, right? The prices will not rise as much proportionally as the quantity of money did because for the, the P times Q goes up by the full amount, but to the extent that Q goes up, P doesn't need to go up as much to make P times Q go up as much as M did. All right, you could do stuff like that. Or you could say, if the public 
views dollars and treasuries as largely interchangeable when you're in a liquidity trap and interest rates are close to zero or at zero on short-term treasuries, then pumping in a lot more money just makes the velocity of circulation fall, right? That people just add it to their cash balances and they don't, they don't go out and spend more. And so you could double M and then V just gets cut in half, in which case prices don't move. Right, you could say things like that. Okay, so that's the way you would use the equation of exchange to handle this stuff. And but again, I don't like that framework for the reasons we talked about. Okay, so back to the framework that I do prefer, using the cash balance approach. So again, we're using it's just supply and demand, except it's applied to money. So here it's a little bit weird. One thing to keep in mind is when we talk about the price or the market value of money, what does that mean? Right. So think about apples supply of and demand for apples, there's a price. And that means how many dollars per apple or how many dollars per bushel of apples or whatever. When it comes to money, to, what would it mean to say, oh, let's, how, you know, you move along the demand curve for money, you'll move along the supply curve for money. What is that on the, the y-axis? Is it dollars? Are we saying that, oh, the price of a dollar could be Three dollars or four dollars? Well, no, that doesn't make sense. That's not what we're talking about. If the market value of money goes up, it doesn't mean that the number of dollars you have to pay for a dollar bill goes up, right? That's not what it means because that's that's crazy. A twenty dollar bill is it has the market value of twenty dollars. Period. So what we mean when it comes to money, when we talk about its market value, we mean its purchasing power in terms of real goods and services. And, and actually other assets too, like financial assets and whatever. But the things you go buy with money, the price is quoted in dollars, is the inverse of the purchasing power of money. Right? So if a car costs $20,000 originally, and then it, things change and now the car costs $40,000, the purchasing power of money got cut in half. Right? The number of cars you could buy with a dollar got cut in half. It went from one twenty thousandth to one forty thousandth, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so in general, if prices quoted in dollars go up, that means the purchasing power of a given dollar goes down. And vice versa, if the purchasing power of money goes up, that means prices quoted in that money have dropped. Okay, so it, it moves in the opposite direction from what you're normally thinking of. Again, when, when the price of apples goes up, quoted in dollars, you say, ah, apples are more valuable in the marketplace now. Their market value has gone up, but with money, it's the other way around. If the price of apples quoted in dollars goes up, you would say dollars have become weaker. Whereas if the price of apples quoted in dollars goes down, you'd say dollars have become stronger. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is you might be confused and say, wait a minute, we mean the demand to hold money isn't that like infinite? Like at some point, I'm going to get sick of apples. I don't want to have more and more apples. But with money, don't I always want more money? And so, you know, isn't that kind of a weird, weird frame? Like the, does this concept of demand to hold money really apply? Or isn't it, you know, contrived or, or perverse? No, because we're using that term specifically. It's not the demand for wealth. It's the demand for money. And that's why often we say cash balances to really drive home the point that we're talking about money itself. We, we don't mean financial assets broadly construed. We mean actual money. So for our purposes here, it clearly includes, like if we're talking about the U.S., paper currency, you know, Federal Reserve notes, $20 bills, pictures of dead presidents on green pieces of paper. That's certainly what we mean when we talk about cash balances. Also, if you want it would be fine to include checking account balances, right? So if you have $300 in your checking account that's tied to your debit card, you can include that if you want to for the analysis, all right? Because in most applications, you having $300 in your checking account and you've got your debit card is going to be equivalent to you having it in cash in your wallet, in actual currency, okay? Because most places, those are interchangeable, all right, in, in certain applications, they aren't, in which case you can get more specific and say, what do I mean by cash balances? Well, here I mean debit card. Because in some places you can't use cash, right? So it goes the other way too. It used to be that cash was king, like currency, but now that's not necessarily true, all right? But for our purposes here, when I'm saying cash balances or the demand for money, I mean 
green pieces of paper in your wallet or your purse and possibly checking account balances, but that's it. So, and the way to think about this is suppose your uncle passes away and you're in his will and he gives you $50,000 and part of it is the inheritance. You're like, oh, great. And it turns out the guy was a fan of Joe Salerno and he hates banks. And so the $50,000 that he has to give you was just in suitcases in the form of $20 and $50 bills. Now, of course, in reality, the DEA would come in and seize that, but let's assume we lived in a free society. Well, then there wouldn't be dollars either, but you get the point. You get all these suitcases full of actual currency. Are you just going to hang on to that in that form? Probably not. You're probably going to diversify out of that. You're going to think, whoa, that's too much cash for me to be sitting on. It doesn't mean you're going to go buy a bunch of Cheerios and milk and bread with it. You're probably going to keep it in the form of financial assets. Maybe you're going to take a quick vacation and blow some of it, but you're probably going to convert it to other forms of wealth. It's just you don't want it concentrated. That's too much cash to be holding, right? So you're probably going to use it to go, you know, you might put some on your bank account, but then even there, you're probably not going to have an extra $50,000 sit in your checking account for the next six years. You're probably going to use it to buy bonds or put it into a money market fund or whatever. Go buy some real estate in Australia because you think the big one's coming. Okay, so again, notice there that your demand to hold cash is not infinitely elastic, even though you might say a lot of people would be quite willing to absorb huge amounts of an influx of wealth. That's not the same thing as saying they would be willing, they would be content to just keep it all in the form of extra cash balances. No, they would diversify away from that. Okay, so what are some of the things that influence your demand to hold cash well, one main thing is economists think that largely what you're really trying to hold is a certain purchasing power, that you're, what you're really focusing on is real cash balances. Okay, so other things equal, if prices tend to be higher, you're probably going to want to hold higher nominal cash balances because really when you're walking around, like if you just feel comfortable, let's say having whatever, $200 of cash in your wallet right now, it's not because there's something magic about 200 it's because the kinds of things you can buy, the way you conduct your daily life for $200, that's how much you want to be able to buy on the spot without having to use your debit card or go hit an ATM. Right? Whereas if prices were much lower, you would be comfortable walking around with less than $200. Right? So somebody from 1950, a regular middle class person is probably not walking around with $200 in his wallet. That would be a lot of money. Like you'd be worried if you lost it or got mugged or something. And they say, no, I'm not going to need $200 on any given day that I'm not, you know, unless it's some planned expense that you can foresee. But just in terms of how much do I like to have in cash on my person, you're probably not going to be walking around $200 back in 1950, certainly if you live outside of a big city. Whereas nowadays, especially for people who live in big cities, having $200 in cash on you isn't that ostentatious. That's, you know, if you go out for drinks with your coworkers after work, that's probably you know what you need just to satisfy the bar tab. Okay, so so that's one element of it. That other things equal the higher the prices in the community, the larger your nominal cash balances. Because what you're really targeting is real cash balances. Um, another factor would be interest rates. Other things equal the rate of return, especially on very safe bonds, would reduce your cash balances, right? Because that kind of, in a sense, is the opportunity cost of holding cash. Because if you're holding currency, you're earning a 0% nominal rate of return on it, right? If you have a $100 bill in your wallet, that's not going to grow into more dollars over time. Whereas if you took that money and bought a short-term treasury, it would grow at the rate of return of treasuries. Okay, so just to say that again, the nominal rate of return on Financial assets, particularly ones that are very short term and considered very safe, those are like near substitutes for cash, especially if they're very liquid assets because you can turn them into cash without suffering a loss in the market value. So for that type of asset, the higher the nominal rate of return, other things equal, the lower your demand to hold cash balances because that's in a sense the opportunity cost to you of keeping your wealth in the form of cash. All right, so if one month treasuries yield 8%, 
that's going to make you less willing to hold wealth in the form of cash and actual currency than if one month treasuries are yielding 0.1%. All right. Again, these th all these statements are other things equal. Another example is other things equal the speed with which the purchasing power of money is falling it would reduce your demand to hold cash balances. Okay, so notice that sounds at first like I'm contradicting the first principle I enunciated, but it's not. It's a level versus rate of change. Okay, so other things equal, the higher prices are, the more cash you want to hold, but other things equal, the more rapidly prices are rising, the less cash you want to hold. All right, so if there were a one-shot devaluation and prices all doubled, other things equal, you'd want to hold twice as much in your cash balances because you want to have the same purchasing power. But if you're, near, if you're in the midst of a rapid hyperinflation where prices keep doubling every week, you don't want to be sitting in cash because you're, you know, it's purchasing power is getting crushed every minute. And so you'd want to hold a lot less cash, at least proportionally, and be, be in other assets to at least try to keep up and not get crushed. Okay, so that's how that works. So now let's use this framework. Oh, and so in terms of equilibrium, then the idea is once we specify each individual's demand to hold cash, then you can construct the community's aggregate demand to hold cash, just like, you know, the mar or I don't want to say aggregate because then you say aggregate demand. It sounds like it's a Keynesian thing. That's not what I mean. Let's call it the market demand, just like with apples. You can say, what's the, each individual's demand for apples? Then you can construct the market demand for apples and interact that with the market supply. So same thing with cash. Now, when it comes to the supply of cash, if you want to, you can just do it like a snapshot at, in time, at any moment in time, in which case the supply curve is basically a vertical. That there's, the number of dollars is what it is, and then you can say, is the market in equilibrium or not? To the extent that you allow for the passage of time in your analysis, you're like, oh yeah, I don't mean this second, I'm talking like over the course of a week, how is equilibrium approached in the market for cash balances? then the supply curve might not be vertical depending on what assumptions you make and what kind of institutional framework there is. Okay, so like if we were on a strict gold-using economy where there's no government issuing paper and, and, not, and banks aren't either, if it's just people use gold coins, let's say, then if the demand to hold gold goes way up, that would push up the market price of gold, which means prices in the community quoted in gold ounces would go down. So then that would make it profitable for the owners of gold mines to go hire more workers and other resources and, and mine more gold, bring more gold, quote, into circulation, even though remember, all the gold at any moment is owned by somebody. And, you know, more gold gets mined, stamped into coins. And so that's, that's the way that process would unfold over time. Just like if the quantity, if the demand for apples suddenly shoots up in the short term, that makes the market price of apples shoot up. But then... Over the long term, the supply curve of apples is, uh, is not as steep. And so more apples get brought into, into the economy because, you know, farmers respond and, and plant more and whatnot. All right. So likewise with gold, if, if, if the money is gold and all of a sudden the community wants to hold more gold, again, the immediate response is there's price deflation quoted in gold ounces that then stimulates, though, the production of more gold than otherwise would have occurred. And so the quantity of gold held by the community rises over time more rapidly than it otherwise would have. And so then you can see prices quoted in gold go back up. All right, so that's how you would use this framework for something like that. Let me just in general do a couple other thought experiments just to see, see how this framework works. Let's say... Uh, Let's say we're, we're, we're using, it's a dollar economy, like modern times in the U.S. And Ben Bernanke gets into his helicopter and he goes around and he just doubles everyone's quantity of dollars, right? So however many dollars you have right now, Bernanke comes and boom, magically gives you twice as many. So, or, you know, gives you the same amount. So you're holding twice as much as you were before. What's going to happen? Well, that means if we originally were in equilibrium, and notice, by the way, when we say we're talking here, you might say, oh, it's the money market. Well, be careful because colloquially when people say money market, they mean like mutual funds, money market, mutual funds and stuff like that. They mean things that are very liquid 
they, they don't mean actual cash in your in your possession, right? So I'm going to try to avoid the term money market because I don't want to confuse you. We're talking here about the market for clearing the holding of cash balances, like actual green pieces of paper and or um, checkable balances at a bank. Okay, so if originally we were in equilibrium and that cash balance market, and then Bernanke now doubles everybody's holdings, what does that mean? Everyone now is holding twice as much money in nominal terms and real terms than they want to. So they want to get rid of it, but notice the community in the aggregate can't get rid of dollars. No one's going to burn dollars. That's not how you're going to get rid of it. So you try to spend it on something, there's a recipient on the other end receiving it, right? So the number of dollars is not going to go down just because the community, everybody thinks right now this moment, I'm holding too much money. So what has to happen? Well, other things have to adjust such that equilibrium is restored. So what starts to happen? Prices start going up, right? Because individual merchants, from their point of view, it's going to look like the demand for their products has gone up, right? At a given price for milk and eggs and diamond rings, now all of a sudden the quantity demanded is higher because the community is armed with twice as many dollars. So from the merchant's point of view, it's going to look like the demand for their stuff has gone up. So the equilibrium price will rise. For financial assets, you know, people now armed with twice as many dollars, they're not merely going to go out and buy more eggs and milk. A lot of them are going to go and try to buy more financial assets because they're going to say, oh, wow, I'm wealthier, but I don't want to have all this new wealth just sit in the form of extra cash. Let me go buy some bonds with it. So in the process of buying bonds, other things equal, that's going to raise the market price of those bonds, which means what? It means their yield will go down, right? Because a, a bond's price quoted in money and its yield move out in opposite directions. So notice is the yield on near money substitutes goes down. That means the opportunity cost of holding money goes down, which means the demand for holding money goes up. So that's one of the ways that equilibrium gets restored is once Bernanke dumps all this extra money in the economy, at least in the short term, that's going to cause short-term interest rates to go down, which means people are more willing to hold a higher fraction of their wealth in the form of cash because they're not getting dinged as much, right? If, if short-term interest rates are lower, other things equal, you're more willing to hold your wealth in the form of cash because you're, you're not losing out on, as much on the opportunity cost, okay? So that's another way that you're going to induce the community to be happy in the new equilibrium to be holding twice as much cash is that short-term interest rates are going to be lower than they were originally. Okay, um, so, that's, so that's how that works. Okay, and that process would have to continue until the point at which the community is now happy to hold twice as much in their cash balances. It doesn't mean every individual holds twice as much as before. Just like if the quantity of apples gets doubled, it's not that every individual in the new equilibrium eats twice as many apples as they did originally. No, some people are going to eat more than twice as many apples and some people won't eat twice as much. Okay particularly like somebody who's allergic to apples is going to eat zero in the original equilibrium and eat, well, I guess you could say two times zero is zero, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, so one more. This will be a good one. I like this one. Suppose the community's demand to hold cash balances increases. Like maybe they get worried about the future and they think there's going to be a bad economy and so everyone wants to bulk up on their cash holdings. If you have a... George Selgin, Larry White banking system, the banks could just print up extra notes to satisfy that. And so if the community wants to hold twice as much money, prices don't need to change. Just the banks quickly come in and quote automatically, passively double the quantity of money if it's construed as including bank notes that are immediate claims on money. But suppose we have a more honest system. Hey, a little joke there, folks. What if you have like just a pure gold money system, the immediate effect, and suppose that you, for whatever reason, the, the gold's all gone, okay? You know, it's, it's too hard to mine more gold, can't find any more, or maybe we're on a, a, a moon base and they're cut off from the rest of, the, of humanity and there's just a certain amount of gold coins, period. That's it. That's all there's ever going to be. And that's the money they use. Suppose the demand for gold coins doubles, How's that going to be satisfied? Well, the only way it's going to be satisfied is if prices quoted in gold 
get cut in half, right? That that's how it's going to work. Because again, remember, we think that what people really care about is real cash balances. So if people all of a sudden want to hold double the quantity of money measured in real terms, and they can't increase the nominal gold coin balance because there, there aren't any more, the only way to satisfy that to restore equilibrium is prices quoted in gold get cut in half. And then everybody looking at the same number of gold coins they had before, but now prices are half what they used to be, says, ah, I can now buy twice as much stuff with my cash balances as I could originally. So now I'm back in equilibrium. I'm happy. And you can, I don't want to get bogged down the tails, but you can think through what actually happens to restore equilibrium. That Originally, when people want to hold more cash, want to hold more gold coins, they don't spend as much, right? They restrict their spending on goods and services and other financial assets. And so that would make the prices of those things quoted in gold fall, right? The merchant in that economy, from his perspective, is going to see the demand for his tomatoes drop. For a given gold price of tomatoes, you know, how many, how many grains of gold do you have to offer to get a dozen tomatoes? The quantity of tomatoes demanded at, the origin, at any given price, quoted in gold, is going to go down. So the merchant is going to have to cut prices. And so that's how it, you know, and that's, that's true for just about everybody in the community. And so that's why prices would fall and eventually equilibrium would be restored. Okay. So that's how you use that type of framework to handle this stuff. One last one. Notice that in this framework, nothing physical has to change. Just a mere change in expectations can disrupt the equilibrium and induce movements in what, what some people would call the price level. A lot of Austrians don't like that term because it makes it real mechanistic and there's no reason all prices need to move proportionally. All right. So for example, suppose Jay Powell says to everybody, hey, it's not going to happen right now, but next year, you know, 12 months from today, we're going to create 60 trillion new dollars. And just and, and let the government spend it, you know, to finance a Green New Deal, Medicare for all. Basically, we're just going to ask AOC what she wants, and we're going to go ahead and satisfy her with the printing press. But we won't do it right now. We're going to do it starting in a year. So I submit to you that would make prices quoted in dollars go up right away, right? The, the people wouldn't be sitting around waiting for this new influx of $60 trillion in cash before prices started rising. No, what would happen is people anticipating that future price inflation would try to get out of their cash holdings or their dollar holdings now. And then by, and by so doing, that itself would raise prices quoted in dollars because they, in other words, with this framework, the way you'd handle it formally is you'd say people's desired real cash balances in dollars would go way down because of this expectation of the impending price inflation. And the only way then to restore equilibrium, given that dollars aren't going to be destroyed in the short term, is prices quoted in dollars would have to go up so that the real purchasing power of your dollar holdings is lower as you wanted it to be. Okay? So that's, that's what would happen. And again, I'm, I don't have time to dwell on this stuff, but I encourage you, if you think this stuff is fun, just think through it. It's, it's neat. Like everybody trying to get into out of dollars and into stocks or real estate, well, there's not more stocks or real estate to go around just because people's expectations change. So what has to happen is the price of those assets has to go up to choke off the excess demand, right? So it's like originally given current market prices, everyone's like, whoa, I don't want to hold this many dollars. I would much rather give up $100 to get an extra share of Microsoft. So because there's not more shares of Microsoft to go around, what has to happen is the market clearing price of Microsoft all of a sudden goes up to whatever, $500. So now people say, oh, geez, even though I expect Jay Powell to dump a bunch of money in the economy 12 months from now, I actually don't want to go buy a share of Microsoft because now it costs $500 and that's too, that's too much. Or that's, you know, at that price, eh, I'm happy just keeping my cash. I'm not going to go try to buy that. Whereas at $100, lots of people would have said, whoa, that's a, that's a bargain given the new information. I want to get in on that. Okay, so that's how equilibrium gets restored. And, and I stress this because with all of these things, 
I think people fall into the trap of trying to say, oh, well, this is what causes inflation. No, 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 this is what causes it. It's the government spending money on bridges or it's the government spending, you know, giving money to uh, unemployed workers who spend it. Or if the government does such as, and you get into this habit of thinking only certain types of things cause price inflation. And I'm saying, just keep in mind, just news could cause it. Just a change in people's subjective expectations could cause price inflation, right? So it's don't don't get caught up in a trap of thinking in your framework, price inflation can only come from one cause and anybody else is focusing on incidental stuff that, no, in general, there's all sorts of things that could cause prices to change. Okay, so now with this framework in mind or as the backdrop, let's turn to the question, is issuing debt per se inflationary? So here, it's easy. We say, oh, we, we have a supply and demand framework. So really, we can answer that question by just saying, when an institution issues more debt, does that affect the supply of money? And or does it affect the demand to hold cash balances? Because once you answer those questions, then you would know, is it going to affect the, the market clearing price of money or purchasing power of money? Right? Just like if you want to say, hey, there's more rain, is that going to affect the price of apples? Is that going to cause, quote, inflation or deflation in apple prices? You could just decompose it and say, well, is the extra rainfall going to cause a change in the supply of apples? Is it going to cause a change in the demand for apples? And that's the way you would do it, right? So it's not that it's a theory. It's just a framework for categorizing the different types of possible influences, okay? So say, uh, you know, a corporation issuing more debt, is that going to cause changes in, in prices and here, where I'm going with this is, if you remember, for those of you who watched the, the long discussion I had with Rowan, he was trying to argue that whether the Treasury financed a trillion dollars in new spending by issuing more debt, you know, by running up the deficit an extra trillion, or by stamping a platinum coin with the words one trillion dollars and having the Fed monetize it, he was arguing that that was equivalent and I was saying, no, in my framework, that's only equivalent if that extra trillion in treasury debt is monetized by the Fed. If instead you just issue those trillion dollars in extra treasury securities to the private sector, it's not that more dollars have been created because the private sector had to give the trillion dollars over. So to me, you know, it was obvious that the Fed creating a trillion dollars was way more inflationary than the treasury merely issuing a trillion dollars in new securities and not having it monetized, right? And Rowan, he, he was actually bouncing around. I don't, I don't know if it's, he just objected to me trying to break it down into piece by piece explanations because he did say that at one point, sort of like, well, Bob, I'm looking at the whole operation. You know, the whole episode is one package deal. You're trying to break it up into the constituent elements. And I was like, well, well yeah. I mean, to understand what actually causes something, of course you'd break it up in the constituent elements to figure out, you know, where you went wrong. You know, it's like if a NFL team loses the Super Bowl, you want to isolate, what did we do wrong? You don't want to just say, oh, the whole thing was bad. I mean, no, maybe <laughs> the first half was good. You were winning and then things fell apart. You'd want to isolate what was the specific element in the sequence of actions that causes the thing we didn't like. So that, that to me, that's, that's why you would break it up. And if, if Rowan's saying and other MMTers say, oh, yeah, the treasury issues more debt and then the Fed monetizes it and that's inflationary. Right, I agree, but I would say it's not the treasury spending per se and it's not the treasury deficit per se that's the inflationary part. It's the Fed monetizing it that is. Okay, so anyway though, well, let's put that, so, that, so that's the context here, but in general with this framework to say is a corporation issuing debt inflationary, by which we mean is that going to change the purchasing power of money Again, you would decompose it and say, well, does it affect the supply of money and does it affect the demand for money? So supply, no, it, it clearly doesn't, right? The number of dollars that exist is not affected by whether a corporation issues more bonds or not, right? The number of dollars is what it is, okay? At least in the short term. And then when you say, okay, is it going to affect the demand for dollars? So here, this is interesting. It is true that to the extent that this new debt is considered a substitute for cash balances by some members of the community, 
then it is true that issuing more debt could reduce the demand for cash. Just like if if Sprite, if the supply of Sprite goes up, like you know the, the engineers at the Sprite factory figure out a way to make more gallons of Sprite, liters of Sprite with the same amount of inputs. And so other things equal, the supply of Sprite goes up. That would change the market price of Coke, right? Because Sprite and Coke are substitutes. They're not perfect substitutes, but they're substitutes, okay? So likewise here, and if you think through how does that happen well, because as the supply of Sprite goes up, then the market price of Sprite goes down. Because Sprite is cheaper, that reduces the demand for Coke because there are certain people for whom Sprite and Coke are decent substitutes. If Sprite all of a sudden became a lot cheaper, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be willing to buy Coke at the old prices. They would switch over. So the demand for Coke goes down. That means the market clearing price of Coke goes down. Okay, so likewise here, you can run through a similar process if you want to. I'm not going to spell it out. I'll leave it as an exercise for the listener. But if to the extent that there are investors out there who think holding bonds issued by GE are a close substitute for holding currency. So be, keep in mind, when I, I don't mean money market mutual. If I'm talking currency, then it would be true that GE issuing more bonds would, would reduce the demand to hold cash and, and then would hence reduce the purchasing power of cash, the market value of cash, and hence prices quoted in dollars would tend to be a little bit higher because of that. Now, notice though, I think the effect would be very small and it certainly wouldn't be one for one in most cases, right? So in other words, issuing a million dollars in new debt in terms of GE bonds I would say would have a much smaller impact on the purchasing power of money than would issuing a million dollars in new currency, right? Just like creating more gallons of or liters of Sprite would affect the price of Sprite a lot more than it would affect the price of Coke. You follow that? So again, if what we're wondering is the purchasing power of dollars Yes, this framework does allow for the possibility that issuing more debt changes the purchasing power of dollars, but surely in the vast majority of cases, the effect would be much, much smaller than the effect from creating more dollars directly. And so that's where I was coming from when I was talking to Rowan about it makes a huge difference whether the treasury finances a trillion dollars in additional spending by issuing bonds to the private sector and basically just absorbing pre-existing dollars versus turning to the Fed and having it create a trillion new dollars, right? Now, but notice this framework does allow, I can build bridges here. There are certain Keynesians and MMT people, I'm sure, that would argue in a liquidity trap when short-term interest rates are basically zero on treasury debt, that there, there is, that, that you know, like one month treasuries that basically yield 0% are virtually interchangeable with actual currency for a lot of investors. And so that's why the Fed coming in with QE, creating trillions of dollars in extra base money, but using it to buy treasuries that were yielding basically 0%, if that's what they did, wouldn't have much of an inflationary impact in terms of the purchasing power of money because they're just swapping nearly identical assets. Okay, so... I don't think that's not fully right because it's the investors in, in question. Like, let's say you're an investor and you buy a million dollars worth of new treasury debt. And then the Fed comes along and monetizes it. You as the investor, it's, let's look at it one step at a time. When you're an investor and the treasury issues a million dollars in extra debt and you, you use a million dollars to buy it, probably you readjust your portfolio. Okay, so probably the way you got the million dollars of cash to be able to buy the newly issued treasury debt, it's not that you had a million dollars in your checking account that otherwise would have sat in your checking account and you drew down your cat, your long-term cash balances by a million. No, you probably sold off other assets to raise the cash to then buy the treasury debt. So notice Rowan was actually getting into that stuff a little bit in our discussion. So it's not that I think that's wrong. Okay. So again, let me just say it in plain English from scratch. Somebody who buys an extra million dollars of treasury debt probably 
is not going to, quote, afford that by reducing his cash holdings by a million dollars. He's probably going to reduce his holdings of, you know, certain st- risky tech stocks and real estate and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so it's not that that person's demand for dollars went down by a million. So again, even so the, so don't think of it as, oh, if the treasury issues a trillion dollars in total extra debt to finance new spending and the community necessarily hands over a trillion dollars in currency or checking account balances that, oh, well, Bob, didn't the community's demand to hold dollars go down by a trillion? So isn't it a wash? No, because again, those people who handed over the trillion dollars collectively to buy the trillion dollars in new debt, they're going to rebalance their portfolio. They're only going to slightly reduce their individual cash balances. So the community as a whole, it must be that, you know, that's where the, the, the change in cash balances has to occur. Okay. And so again, back to the Sprite versus Coke distinction. Okay. So nonetheless, though, theoretically, you, you could see that the case where, all right, yeah, there is an effect. Whereas before I was thinking there was zero effect. Now that I'm spelling out my framework, I'm realizing, ah, I should pay attention to my own model better. Um, Yes, theoretically speaking, to the extent that some investors view currency itself as equivalent to short-term treasuries, the mere fact of issuing short-term treasuries could decrease the demand to hold currency, and so that could be inflationary. So anyway, though, let me just step back, though. Still, when people were saying during the Obama years, when Keynesians were saying, oh, these you know Glenn Beck types and Bob Murphy types – are looking at QE and freaking out, but they don't realize that, no, in a liquidity trap, these are interchangeable assets. Okay, so that's true that the mere act of the Fed monetizing it, I could see you arguing it's not nearly as inflationary as if treasury yields were still at 5%. Fair enough. But the Fed was monetizing newly issued debt, right? So the whole process was still inflationary. All right, so maybe now I sound like an mmt here, but my point being right that the the treasury was running trillion dollar deficits i think there were four years in a row there were at least three I, I can't remember off the top of my head where the obama administration ran a deficit that was higher than a trillion dollars and then the fed was monetizing it so if you want to argue oh the qe is not inflationary because they're just swapping equivalent assets okay but the fact that the, then the treasury was issuing those extra assets According to your own logic, in the midst of a liquidity trap, the treasury issuing a trillion dollars in extra debt would be like dumping a trillion dollars newly printed into the economy. All right. So either way, it's inflationary in that respect. All right. So I think probably that's a a decent place for me to stop here. So with all this stuff, again, you can take it as deeply as you want. And I just wanted to give this framework for thinking through money and debt. Oh, I guess the, the other, one other loose end. The, uh, when it comes to saying, you know, is, the, is issuing more debt per se inflationary? Because here I was, I was showing all the action to the extent that you wanted there to be action would have to be through the demand side. Actually, there is a caveat there, an asterisk, if you will. There are certain institutions whose debt claims are themselves treated by the community as being very close substitutes to money namely commercial banks. And so there, and it's particularly, you know, when we're in a regime of fractional reserve banking, there is a sense in which if the banking system extends credit and makes loans to people, that arguably increases the, the supply of money. Or in particular, if we're going to say like M1, which is currency plus checkable demand deposits, you know, your, your checking account balance, there, there is a sense in which the banking system can quote, create money, right? So you go, you put $1,000 in actual currency into your checking account. Your bank balance goes up by $1,000. You're walking around town. You check the ATM. You've got an extra $1,000 in your bank account. You think you have that money. The bank takes 900 and lends it to somebody else. Now that person thinks he's got $900 extra, right? So M1 just went up by $900, right? This isn't like a trick, like for real, there's a legitimate sense economically in which the community now just had an influx of $900. And that's going to weaken the purchasing power of money just as surely as if 
the uh, you know printing press created an extra nine hundred dollars in currency. Okay, so there's that element. Whereas, like Roland was talking about, oh well, there's private credit creation, like you know a bar tab. So yes, the your local bartender, if he thinks you're good for it and gives you drinks and just puts it on your tab, that lets you economize on money, right? You don't have to have as as high cash balances knowing that, oh, whenever I need a drink, well, do you need a drink? Maybe sometimes you do. I can just go to the bar and put it on my tab and I can finance, you know, I can actually quote pay for it later. That's going to make you other things equal hold fewer dollars in your wallet. So that allows you to economize on cash, but that doesn't have nearly the inflationary impact in the system as a whole because you can't go to the grocery store and spend your bar credit to get groceries. The way if Citibank thinks you're good for it and gives you a loan, that you can go to the store and swipe your debit card and get groceries with claims, $2 issued by Citibank that you're transferring, you know, from your possession to the grocery store. Okay. So that's in case you got confused when I was talking to Rowan about that stuff, that's what I was saying that yes, there is a sense in which private credit creation can be inflationary, not merely through the demand side, but also the supply side to the extent that the community views those debt instruments as being, at least in certain circumstances, interchangeable with money proper. And that, again, is the whole point of Mises talking about fiduciary media and what he thinks drives the boom-bust cycle and why some of us are very skeptical of fractional reserve banking because there is a sense in which that practice allows the banking system to expand and contract the money supply through their credit policies. Okay? So I will link to my... QJAE article on this stuff if you want to see that spelled out. But I just do want to fill in that that gap in the argument. And hopefully, like I say, all the stuff that I'm saying now, for those of you who were quite heroic and listened to the whole discussion with Rowan, now you say, oh, that's what Bob was getting at. Okay. Well, with that, I will wrap up. Thanks for your attention, everybody, and I'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.